as you heard, we did go to camp. Camp is one of my favorite events because camp, I said, I told these students this morning, camp provides an atmosphere that, that is so fun and joyful, but that's not the important thing. We get to worship the one true God, and that, that's all that matters. We can do that anywhere. We can do that at camp. We can do that here. We can do that in our room. So I got a couple students. I'm going to start with the ladies first, of course. Miss Carly, if you can come up here. Uh, we got a couple testimonies um, that I would love you guys to hear and just hear what happened at camp for them. Hi, my name is Carly. My life before Christ was not on the best track. When I was three, my biological mother, who was not the best person either sometimes, was killed. And I was being adopted into one of the best families anyone could ever ask for. I grew up with two younger sisters until I was about 12 or 13-ish. We had all gone to church together for a little bit, but then stopped. My parents had another baby, which I was not happy about because that meant more attention for the baby. And that's when it seemed as if everything fell apart. So I started hanging around some of the worst people you can imagine and doing the most sneaky, irresponsible stuff behind my parents' back for attention. Through middle school, I had some of the worst friends and some of the most toxic relationships anybody could ever imagine. Then I really started to struggle with myself mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I began to question after all of this, is God even real? Then one day towards the end of my freshman year, a girl that I could not even begin to tolerate came up to me and invited me to her youth group on Wednesday night. <laughs> I respectfully declined because, well, she annoyed me and I felt church just wasn't for me. The next week comes around and she asks me to go again and I just say yes so that way she'll leave me alone. I go in on that Wednesday night and I feel welcomed. I don't feel judged and I just feel like I'm in a safe place. I now go to youth group every Wednesday and I now call this girl my best friend. Summer rolls around and we go to church camp together. We were sitting there at the Tuesday night service that was only girls and Pastor Joey asked us some really difficult questions. And I began to realize that I am not alone. I realized that nobody's alone and it all got super emotional. But then I realized that Christ will never be there to judge me for anything that has happened to me and that he would never let me down. After that night, I changed into a new person. I felt better, I wasn't insecure and mostly I knew I was not alone. I started to look at the good in the world and I started to look for the good in everybody to try and to try and bring it out in them. I know I want Christ to lead me through life. I am living for the good that is brought out in me and I'm living for my amazing friends and my even more amazing family. If it was not for the girl who got on my last nerve every single day, AKA Reese Borders, the awesome youth pastor Jordan and the wonderful Miss Lexi and every single person who sits in the room with me on Wednesday nights, I have no idea where I would be as a person. But God, you know, but God. So next we have Mr. Luke Holum. Let's give it up for Luke. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Luke. And uh, at camp on Wednesday night, the Pastor Joey talked about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people got baptized, including me. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so a lot of people got healed that night, and uh, that night was when I realized I needed to uh, 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 clean my life because uh, I was putting things before God. And uh, so I have started to try to eliminate the things that were being put over God and uh, get those out of my life. That's only two testimonies. All 15 of these kids, I watched them every day. They really experienced something that maybe they m not maybe not get, but they had a comfortability there, and they, they grew together as a group. Um, we're missing a couple, but man, what what an experience and what a great time! And again, just like just like the back to school bash and stuff like that. If you guys know students, these are just opportunities to just get them into the doors that maybe they might not grace the doors here, but just an opportunity to get them through and get them invited and get them to feel welcomed because that's what we do because the love of Christ should shine through us, right? So, but keep praying for us. This youth group is doing great and I'm proud of these kids. And uh, that's, that's what we got. Miss Gala. All right. 
Miss Lori, Mr. Kevin, how about bringing your kids up here? You know, we got some people out sick and some families out sick, but that doesn't stop us. We are focused on one thing, and that is worshiping God this morning. So if you look around, put your blinders on, and keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Why don't you stand with me, turn around and greet someone this morning. Tell them it's good to be in the house of the Lord. God is awesome. Yes. I wish I had that kind of energy. Yes. Hallelujah.
Can we praise him this morning? Come on, can we praise him this morning? He is worthy to be praised. My Bible said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Can we as Pentecostal spirit-filled people, can we just lift our hands and praise him one more time? Come on, just let, let your voice be heard in heaven. Father, we thank you and we praise you this morning. Father, we love you and honor you and glorify you, Lord. We bless you today, God. We bless you today. Father, we love you and honor you today. Thank you, Lord. Now, can you put your hands together? Give him the best praise, the best one we've ever given him. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, if for nothing else, I mean, we've come to lift up the name of Jesus. But can I tell you, when I look over here and I see our youth standing up here to worship... I've said it a hundred times. I'll say it a hundred more times. That's not the church of the future. That is our church. That is our church. Let me just go a little further. Can I just challenge you? I know maybe not everybody can, but can I just challenge you? It's sad to think that we want our youth to worship and we let them worship by themselves. Can I tell you there's a whole lot of room up here? There's a whole lot of room for us to worship him. I, I just want to challenge you. Listen, our youth, college career, we missed you up here. Uh, let me challenge you. Uh, listen, it's not about just coming up here and standing. It's about worshiping. It's about worshiping God. And can I tell you, when you realize what God has done for us, can I tell you, a pew should not hold us. We sung the song, I'm free. Can I tell you, we ought to get free. We ought to get free. Can you just praise him one more time? Come on. He is worthy to be praised. 
worthy to be praised. If you can, I just want you to reach over and grab somebody by the hand. We're going to pray. Uh, as you can look around, there, there's several people uh, today that have called this morning not feeling well and, and using their head. They decided to stay home today and not come here and just spread it. So I want us to pray for them. I want us to pray that God would have his way. A lot of needs, a lot of needs. Brother Gary is getting ready to have surgery uh, Carla's going to be having surgery. Uh, we've got a lot to pray for, but we've got a lot to praise God. The Father, God, we love you and thank you for another day. God, it's a day that you've made. It's a day that you have blessed us with. Father, we come to you today thanking you and praising you, God. God, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. You are an awesome and a mighty God. And Father, there's not anything at all that's too hard for you. You are greater than any sickness, any disease. You are greater. And Father, I pray that today, God, we pray for those, God, that are going to be scheduled for surgery. We pray for them, God. And not only do we pray for them, but God, we pray for the doctors. God, we pray that the great physician will put his hands on the physician's hand. Lead and guide and direct, Father. I pray for those, God, that are home this morning, God, not feeling well. God, I, I just ask you to reach down and to touch them, Father. God, you know exactly what they have need of this morning. And I pray that today, God, that you would reach down and touch them. And Father, prepare our hearts today, God, for the things that you have in store for us. God, we've come today to lift up your name. And I pray today, God, have your way. Do what needs to be done. And God, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, give him praise before you're seated in the house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ushers, will you come? We're going to receive our tithe and offering this morning. And we, we are thankful that this is a part of our worship. We worship God in our giving today, and I'm thankful for that. I, I, let me just say this. I, 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 I can't brag on you enough. I really can't. It, it's, I, I am amazed every time I get a report and I look at it. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at what God is doing. I'm amazed at what God has afforded us to be able to do. I, I, I am. I am amazed. I, I hear churches that are struggling, churches that are, their, their attendance is down, their finances is down. And, and I, I, I look and I think, God, what are you doing? And can I tell you, this is just my opinion. I think that we are sitting on a launch pad. I, I really do. I think we're sitting on a launch pad that is getting ready to explode and, and, and see God do some incredible things. I, I believe that. If, if we were not doing right things, I don't think the enemy would fight, be fighting nearly as hard against us. But can I tell you, God has always been and always will be victorious in every battle that you and I face. And I want us just to remember that. Listen, no matter what you're going through, God is able. And he's more than enough. Man, I sat there this morning and I hear those testimonies of the kids. And I really like the first one. I really like the first one because the girl that she didn't like. To become her best friend because she wouldn't quit asking her to come to church. I, I like that because that's my niece. <laughs> I, I like that and I think, you know, here's, here's a young girl that asked somebody that didn't like her to come to church. And the girl that didn't like her told her no, didn't need church. And instead of saying, oh, well. Just go back again and say, hey, what about this week? <laughs> Have you had a change of heart this week? What about this week? And end up, and not only did she come to church, but she came to church, went to camp, had a life-changing experience. Yeah. Can I tell you, the only reason we exist is that people can have an experience and an encounter with God that will change, bring change into their life, that will prepare them for eternity that's just ahead of them. That's why we're here. And can I tell you, you, you have been so faithful. We, we was able to help all of our kids to be able to go to camp because you, because you. And we didn't have to come and, 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 and sell 
you know, peanut brittle and cupcakes and it, you, you've just been faithful. And I, I've always said this, and I, listen, I'm, I'm not throwing stones at anybody that does that. I, I'm just saying, I think for a church, we, we ought to love our kids and love our young adults and young, love our senior adults, but we don't have to beg. I'll never forget, I heard a, heard a preacher, he was down in, I think it was South Carolina, and he said he, when he went to the church, it was always struggling financially, and every Friday, they would do ch- chicken and dumplings, and they would do chicken and dumpling dinners, and, and there was a factory across the water, and they said that they would always take a whole bunch over there. They become known in the community as the chicken and dumpling church. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be known as a chicken dumpling church. I don't want to be known as the pie and cake church. I just want to be known as the Jesus church. I want to be known because we lift him up and we exalt him. And God has met all of our needs. And I just want to say thank you today. We usually, I usually read a text and usually go through a little bit. But I just want to say thank you today. Thank you for that. Would you get your tithe and offering out and can we put it in our hand and can we lift it up toward heaven and we're going to pray. And we're just going to believe God today. Father, God, as we lift our tithe and offering ups to you today, God. Father, you said give and it will be given back to us. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. And God, I just pray that today. God, that you would just show yourself strong. God, I pray that every seed that is sown today, God, every obedient vessel that's in this room today, God. Father, God, we are moved by what we have heard today. God, how one little girl kept asking, wouldn't give up. God, how one young man realized that there was things he was putting ahead of God. And Father, we can say that over and over and over throughout this whole congregation, how things have changed over the weeks and over the years. And God, I thank you for your blessings. So God, we worship you today in our giving. We worship you. We give with a cheerful heart, a grateful heart. God, I pray blessings upon every home, upon every giver. I pray great blessings, God. I pray, God, that they experience that life of abundance. And God, will be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted a big amen.
Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Can you put the words back up there? Set a fire down in my soul. I, I, I want you to look at what we're singing. I, I, I want to go back to probably, let's see, it's probably been 25 years years ago Paul Martin was the district superintendent here in the district of Illinois and I remember he made this statement he said if it's only a song don't sing it I don't care how good words it is if, if it's just a song don't sing it if it's just a sermon that doesn't have a, a way of getting into it don't preach it and I, I, I've always hung on that I, and I was just thinking when we were singing this, I don't know how many times we've sung this before, but set a fire down in my soul. Now listen to what I said, that I can't control. Yes. Yes. We in the Pentecostal church today, we want a fire that we control. We control it. Now I'm not talking about wildfire, I'm not talking about crazy. I'm talking about we want a fire that we control. But we're talking about set a fire down in our soul that I can't control. Can I tell you in the upper room, they couldn't control what was going on. There was a fire that was poured out that changed, literally took Jerusalem and turned it right side up. And we need to have a fire that will come down on us that will literally change us. There's a thing that they put on big trucks called a governor. A governor... It, is, it's, it will only allow the truck to go so many miles per hour. I don't care how far you push the gas pedal down. It will only go so many miles per hour. That's the governor that set. You know what the enemy has done in our church today? He has set a governor on the people's worship. He has set a governor. And it's like you can go this far, but you can't go any farther. See, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when... The Pentecostal church, Assembly of God, Church of God, Church of God and Prophecy, and we got them all in here. I remember when they used to shout. I remember when they would raise their voice and lift their hands and... Where did that go? Well, there was a governor put on it, and now all of a sudden it's like, yeah, don't get too loud. It's almost like when Jesus come into Jerusalem and they begin to shout, and, G- and they said the church... They said to Jesus, they said, Jesus, would you please make them hush? They are just entirely too loud. You know what Jesus said? If they hold their peace, my God, if they hold their peace, literally the rocks will begin to shout out. I wonder how many rocks has cried out in our place. We're going to sing that one more time, and I want us to sing it with our heart. We're going to sing it, and we're going to worship him. Ask him as a prayer. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. Let's sing that again.
we've been praying, we've been asking, we've been believing. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a year and a half, and it's been hard. But God's been with me every step of the way, and I, I continue to believe. And two weeks ago, I went for my CAT scan, and I used to get them about every three months. And the last few, they, there was one spot that was getting bigger in the liver. <laughs> but this time... <laughs> This time, they said it was, they were getting smaller. They were shrinking at least one to two centimeters. And here's the best part. Some that they had seen before, they don't see now. (laughs) Oh, you got to do better than that. You got to praise him. You got to praise him. Can I tell you, it's easy to shout when you dig the ditch, but it's a little bit harder when somebody else. Can I tell you, if you can't shout when somebody else has got the victory while you're still. My God, come on, somebody. Come on, let's give him praise. Man, that's what we've been praying for. We've been praying for that. Can I tell you, sometimes he don't just remove them instantly. Sometimes he just lets the doctors be amazed. They go, wait a minute, they're going in the wrong direction. They're going in the wrong direction. Can I tell you, I believe that not only are they going to shrink, but they're just going to vanish. They're going to be gone. That's what we're praying and that's what we're believing for. We serve a good God. Come on, set a fire down in our soul. Down in my soul. Let's give him the best praise we've given him. Come on. Worthy is the Lord to be praised. My, my, my. Let's pray together. Father, God, we love you and thank you, Father, for another day. God, it's a day that you've created. It's a day that you have blessed us with. It's a day that you have allowed us to be a part of your great creation, God. And Father, as we look around and God, we have the sights that we see, the sounds that we hear. God, we are blessed. We are a blessed, blessed people, Father. God, I just thank you today. God, I thank you, God, for what's happening in our, God, the alive kids. God, I thank you. I thank you, God, to watch these little guys get up and, God, jump and praise you. And, God, for our AO youth, God, that are experience in a deeper river in you and I thank you for that Lord God for our college and career I I, I just bless you today Lord now Father I thank you and I praise you for all that you are going to do all that you have planned to do God we give you the praise the honor and the glory in Jesus name we pray and everybody said amen amen come on give him one more praise in the house come on hallelujah Hallelujah. 
I want you, if you will, I want you to grab your Bible real quick. Turn me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. I, I, I'm going to read the scripture, and I've just taken the, the, the title, if you will, for the message today. I've just taken it from this. I want to talk to you about God is a consuming fire. Say that with me. God is a consuming fire. You and I, we, we sing about the fire. We talk about the fire. But the question I got to ask is this. Are we experiencing the fire? And I think that's something that each one of us individually have got to answer in our own way. Are we experiencing the fire of God? Listen, in these last days that you and I are living in, we must. I don't think there's an option in this. We must Get the fire of God burning in our soul. I, I think it's, it's a must. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. The Bible said this, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's read that together. Come on. For our God is a consuming fire. Say it again. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, can we personalize this? See, I, I, I think I know who your God is, but I'm not for sure. So let, let, let's read this, and I don't think it does it any harm. Instead of our God, I, I want us to say my God. I, I want us to personalize it. If your God's not a consuming fire, then you, you, need, you need to switch teams. So let, let, let's read that personalize it. For my God is a consuming fire. Now say it like you really mean it. For my God is a consuming fire. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you again and we praise you, God. Thank you for allowing us the privilege, the honor to be able to come into your presence, God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, I thank you for that. God, I thank you for the door being wide open and you allowing us that privilege to come in. And to worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth. And Father, I pray that as we have prepared our hearts, God, I believe that our hearts are ready for the word of God. And Father, I pray that as we preach the word of God today, I pray, God, that it find good soil to land on, God. Father, you, you said that there was some stony soil and there was some hard things. But God, you also said there was some good ground. And God, that good ground is 30, 60, and 100 times it will produce. And I pray that today, God... I pray that your word produce an incredible harvest, God. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for all you're going to do. Anoint our ears to hear and anoint this vessel one more time to preach your word. God will be careful to give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 Have you ever noticed there's something about a fire? There's something about a fire that attracts people. I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one in here, but can I tell you, when I see a fire truck, I have a tendency to want to turn and follow the truck. There's just something about that big red truck going down the road with the lights on. Not that I like the fire, but, but there's something that it attracts us. It, it draws our attention. L let me just prove it. When they have a fire, especially if it's a big fire, they will have to call police in to control the crowd because people want to come and see a fire. Can, can I tell you, let's revert that into the spiritual sense. Can I tell you people want to see? They want to see a spiritual. Listen, pe people, don't, people don't drive and go out and stand in awe of a building that's burnt down. That, but oh, let the fire begin to burn. Let the fire begin to burn. Can I tell you, like one of the Wesley brothers said, I don't care if they just come to see us burn. Can I tell you, let them come and see the fire of God. Experience the fire of God again. That's what you and I have need of. See, we're living in a day and a time where a lot of the fire that's in the church is man-made. It's a personality. It's a hype. And soon as the personality is gone, soon as the hype is gone, the people is gone, and the fire is gone. I, I'm not interested in a man-made fire. I, I'm not interested in something that we can work up, something that we can sing fast enough or, or preach louder. I'm talking about there's a fire of God. I, I, I was telling Pastor Jordan, we, 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 most of us have heard about the, the, the old sermon, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. 
Well, we as Pentecostal, I mean, we want the performance. We want the preacher to get up, and we want him to go through the antics and do all the things that he does. Can I tell you one of the greatest messages that we preached in, in the last several hundred years anyway, probably would be that sermon. They said that while he was preaching that sermon, men and women were screaming and crying. Conviction was so great. But here's what nobody tells you about Jonathan Edwards who preached that sermon. He was almost blind. He wrote his sermons out, transcript if you will. He would have to hold it about six inches from his face to be able to read it. So while he was preaching that sermon, nobody could really see his face. He was, can I tell you, it's not about the performance. It's not about the personality. It's not about the charisma that someone has. It's about the fire of God that's burning and about the Holy Ghost that will move and fall up on the people. And you and I are living in a time where we have almost got so accustomed to the music and the hype of the preacher that we don't even know what the fire is no more. Isn't it odd that as soon as the personality and the hype is gone that and it was like, I'm not interested in hype. Listen, I can go to a ball game and get hype. I, 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 I can go watch a, a ball game or I can go watch, you know, I, I can get hyped up on that. I, I don't need hype. I, I, I need God. I, I need a real, genuine experience with God. I, I don't need you to hype me up. I need an experience with God. And I begin to look at this, and I begin to think, God, we, we don't even know the difference anymore. We don't even know the difference. God, help us. We at Abundant Life need a genuine fire of God that will fall that you and I will leave and we won't have to say, well, was that the singing? Was that the preaching? Was that something? No, no. We know that it was the fire of God that fell on the house that brought change into our life. Gail and I, when we first got married, I, I, I've shared this with you, but it kind of just goes along here and I'm going to share it again. When we first got married, I, you know, I was, I was raised in Spillertown, very poor. Uh, I, I, thought, I had, had some weird thoughts when I was a kid of what success was. I thought success, you know, living on a, a, a street that had, you know, a drive or a lane name on it, I thought that was success. I also thought, and I also wanted, one day in my lifetime, I wanted to live in a home that had a fireplace. I see, in the home that I lived in, we, we had Stoker Co., the pot belly. Come on now. <laughs> Some of you looking like... Don't bring up those bad memories. No, they're good memories. Listen, it's an old pot belly stove. We'd have to feed stoke or, or lump coal to it and stuff. And, 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 and I always thought, you know, I've seen pictures of fireplaces. And so I, if, you could, if we could live in a house that had a fireplace, we would be successful. And when Gail and I got married, I was driving a truck and wasn't making much money. And, and uh, we, we lived in a... Some of you, some of you are gonna be disappointed. But let me, let me just share with you. We lived in we lived in a trailer, fifty six by twelve, a mobile home. Yeah, we lived in a mobile. Home. Yeah, it was a trailer, and and, and listen, but but it wasn't just the average mobile home. This was a step up living room mobile home. <laughs> yeah, and we we went. Hey man, remember Sears and Roebuck? We we went to Sears and Roebuck, and we bought a Horner fireplace. <laughs> we, we brought that thing home and, and, and put it in a corner. And, and see, the, the thing it is, it wasn't really a fireplace. It was just, you, you plugged it into a wall outlet. <laughs> and, and it had a 75 watt light bulb in it. That this little thing would kind of turn to kind of make it look like there was a fire going. You know? it, it, but see, it, it wouldn't keep you warm in the winter. It didn't produce anything. It just, it kind of looked like a fireplace in a way, but it really wasn't. And, and sometimes, you know, church kind of looks like a church, but it really not. And I'm preaching better than your own man right now. Sometimes we, we need to realize that not everything that says what it is, it really is. Sometimes we we got to realize what's counterfeit and what's not counterfeit. And can I tell you, that was not a real fireplace. That, would, that was just a fake 
fireplace. And, and we, we need to get to the place where fire begins to fall in the house again. Where people are noticing what's taking place. Kind of reminds me of the story that I heard years ago about, about the preacher. He had been inviting this guy to come to church and wanted him to come to church and, and never could get him to come. And he kept inviting and kept inviting. And one night late, he was in the parsonage asleep and he hears the sirens going and he walks out and the church is in a blaze. Firemen are fighting this huge fire, and he walks out in a helpless man. He's walking around looking at the church, and it's burning down. They're doing the best they can to try to save it, but it's burning down. And as he's walking around just, you know, wondering what's going to take place and how is this all going to work out, he, he looks, and there's the guy that he had been inviting. He just kind of walked over in a very sarcastic way. He looked at the guy, and he said, Odd to see you here at church. What brings you here? And the guy said, it's the first time I saw any fire in the church. See, you and I need fire. We, we, need, we, need, we need the fire of God. Because, see, the fire, it's either helpful or it's harmful. It can do one or the other. It's either your friend or it's your enemy. It can either purify or it can consume. So so I want want to talk for you you just for a few minutes today. The the difference, and there's a huge difference, but but I want to talk about a man-made fire and a God-sent fire. Can I tell you there is huge difference? There is huge difference. So, so let's, let's, let me look at the, a, a man-made fire because most of us are going to understand the man-made fire. In Leviticus chapter 10, let me read it to you. Verses 1 and 2, it said this. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Now, now, I want you to catch that. The sons of Aaron, who was a priest. Aaron was Moses' brother. So, so his two sons... It said that that each of them took a censer and they put fire in it. They put incense on it and they offered a profane fire. The NIV said an unauthorized fire. The old King James said a strange fire. The Amplified in the classic form said an unholy fire. So so they offered an unholy or an unauthorized fire before the Lord, which which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but now when I read that, I say, thank God for grace. Thank God for grace. Listen, so when I begin to look at this, I I begin to think, God, are we offering up to you an unauthorized, an unholy worship? Have we come into his presence and, 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 and just nonchalantly throwing up a praise to him and as if it were something that God did? I I just begin to look at this because they were trying to pass this off as genuine. They were trying to pass it off that they had followed the things that God had commanded them, but yet they had not. But I don't know that they were trying to fool God as much as they were trying to fool people. Sometimes we come into the house of God and we do things our mind is someplace else, our heart is someplace else, and yet we go through the, the mechanics, if you will, of Christianity. We know when to say amen. I mean, we know when to lift our hands, and we know when to... But what about when the fire of God falls? Can I tell you, your hands will go up, and there will be a shout at what would seem like an inappropriate time, but it's a very appropriate time. Not when, when, when it's man-made, it's orchestrated. It, we know how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. But see, this is what God told him. God said, listen, you're to build me an altar, and on that altar, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there is to be a fire. Now, here's what you and I have got to understand about a fire. A fire takes work. You've got to tend to the fire. 
you got to shake some things off that doesn't belong there. Think <laughs> the old ashes that now are not productive need to be shaken off. So, <laughs> see, there's some old things that need to be shaken off. <laughs> That the fire of God can burn, but yet we allow those things of years gone by. Did, did they have their place back then? Absolutely they did. But can I tell you, God, God says I'm, I'm, I'm a God that never changes, and yet he changes. When he said I, I change not what he was talking about, I don't change what my word said. And can I tell you, we got to understand that God is a God of change. He'll reach you in the one way and he'll reach me in another way. And he'll touch you one way and he'll touch somebody else in another way. God is a God of change, but yet he said he's a God that doesn't change. So when you begin to look, there's some things that need to be shook off. I would have never dreamed 35 years ago that I would ever preach without a tie. I mean, 35 years ago, it was blasphemy to get in a pulpit without a tie. And God forbid that you had blue jeans on. Was there any anointing in the tie or the dress slacks? No. But yet we get caught. See, there's some things we need to just shake down and let them... Uh, yeah, yeah. See, you know, what we need to do is to understand they had their purpose then. But now God said in, in Isaiah, he said this, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Can I tell you, I believe God is wanting to do a new thing, but he can't do a new thing until we shake the old things and get the old things out of the way and begin to see God do some new things. But if we just work with the man-made fire... I, see, he told him, he said, this is the way it works. The altar, the altar is to have a fire on it, burn continuously. When you put fire in your censer, you're to go to the altar. You're to get that fire. Not just any fire. Can, can I tell you, I, people say this, I hear them say this. You know, where do you go to church? And they'll say things like this. You know, it really doesn't matter where I go to church as long as I go. That's, that's like saying, it really doesn't matter where I eat just as long as I eat. There are some places I'm not going to eat at. You, you and I have got to understand that we're talking about eternity. We, we, we've got to be very cautious in the things that you and I do. And, and, and when I begin to look at this, he, he gave them orders. He said, you get the fire from there. You put it in your censer. Then you put the incense in it. Then you bring it before me. Then I will accept it. Can I tell you, before we come into the house of God, there needs to be a cleansing. There needs to be a, a, a purification. There needs to be a, a cleansing. We need to say, God, if there's anything that I've done, God, I don't want to do anything that would hinder your move. I, I don't want to be a, that person that, that would be a stumbling block. I want to be a stepping stone, God. God, when our young people come up to worship and our college and career come up, I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a stepping stone for them, God. And yet... Church has become very mechanical. I, I shared with you, and I, I, I can't tell you how many articles I have read, ne never using Scripture. They never use Scripture. But, but the big, what, what they call trending now, is this. The question, how long is a sermon supposed to be? And I don't know where they come up with this. Because it's like 27 minutes. That, that's kind of been the hot button on time-wise, 27 minutes. It's like, What's 27 minutes? What, where is that so special? I mean, think about it. You, you, you can go to some churches and you can set your clock. An hour and 15 minutes. You're in, you're out. I, I, I don't have a problem in, in, in the church serving less than an hour and 15 minutes. I have a problem in telling God it's going to end in an hour and 15 minutes, I don't care what you're doing or what you say. An hour and 15 minutes, we're in and we're out. Listen, I, I don't care how long it lasts. I don't care if it's 15 minutes we last. I don't care. I, I, just, I just don't want to put God in my box and say, God, you got to fit my box and you got to do it in my time frame. And you got, no, see, that's man made. 
We, we, try to, we try to become God and we tell God when he can and where he can and how he can. And so, so we got to come back to a place of understanding. I, I, I just begin to think about, about these two young boys. They're not young boys or young men. I, I, I just begin to think about them. And Pastor Paul, how many times had they watched Daddy walk out to that altar, shake the fire down, put some new wood on it, grab the fire and put it in the censer, put his incense on it, take it into the house of God and offer it up to God, and God would accept it. How many times, I got thinking, probably hundreds if not thousands of times they had saw this, but something happened this particular day. Now, we don't know what happened because it doesn't say, but something happened on this day because God said, you're offering up to me Fire that is unauthorized or unholy or strange. I don't know where you got it at. And yet they were trying to fool God. And I think, how many times do we try to fool God into thinking, or is it not God that we're fooling? It's the people that we're fooling. But ultimately, it's not the people who are going to judge us. It's God Who's going to judge us? So it doesn't matter what your opinion is. It's what God's opinion is. Whether it's acceptable to him. We we, we have seen this happen time and time and time again. Man made fire. What is it? We're dealing with it. We're dealing with it in the churches today. Salvation with no blood. Yet he said, without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sin. And yet we, we, we come up and we don't preach about the blood no more. We just come up and we say, here, recite after me. Now, I don't have a problem in leading someone in a prayer if they don't know how to pray. But I have a problem with everybody have to be recited. I mean, we might as well say, Mary had a little lamb. All they're doing is repeating what we're saying. That doesn't save us. There's got to be a recognition that Jesus, the Son of God, was born of a virgin. He died on a cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose on the third day. He ascended back to heaven. And the blood of Emmanuel still flows today. And it forgives us. We just got to get back to some real basic stuff. But yet now they're preaching salvation with no blood and no change. I can go up and I can recite a prayer and I can continue doing what I'm doing. No, you can't. The Bible said you become a new person. All the old things pass away and everything becomes new. Listen, if there hasn't been a change in your life, I'm not talking about a good feeling. I'm talking about a change in your life. If the person that you despise now becomes your best friend, That's like a change in your life. When you recognize that things that you have placed before God now is illuminated because God is saying you need to make a change. Can I tell you, all of a sudden, that's a change in our life. And until there's a change in our life. See, we're preaching about the Holy Ghost baptism with no power. I went and visited a revival. It's been several years ago now. And one of the preachers that was there was standing beside. In fact, it was the preacher's daughter. He was standing beside. And she was wanting to be filled with the Spirit. And, and he prayed with her and prayed with her and couldn't get her to pray through. And he walked over to her. And in fact, Pastor Dion was with me. We were standing right there. And, and he said, say this. And he started saying, like, tie my tie. Tie my tie. Say, say, it, say it fast. Say, it. All, all they wanted to do was to get her tongue tied, and they said that's the Holy Ghost. No, it's not. Let me just be old today, God. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is when He puts something down in your belly, and the rivers begin to flow out your mouth. That's the Holy Spirit. See, we 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 we've, we've had man-made fire, and so we're using imitations. We preach deliverance without ever being free. 
we, we sing the song. We sung it. The, you know, the chains are gone. I'm free. Really? Some of us have been in chains for so long, we don't even know what freedom is. They tell me, I don't know this to be a fact, they tell me, I've read this in several occasions, that, that when they train a little elephant, they put a, a band around his leg and they drive a stake way down in the ground and that elephant can only go so far and that stake stops him. And he's got it in his mind that he can only go so far when that band's around his leg. And they said when he is a full-grown elephant, if you put that band around his leg, he will only go within like a 10 or 15-foot radius because his mind goes back and he said, I, I'm back stuck to that stake again. I wonder how many of us, we, we've been so bound by tradition or we've been bound by man's laws and stuff that, that when we go to church and, and we talk about freedom and, and we almost get free and the enemy comes up and he puts that clamp around our leg and we go, oh, I can only go this far. I, I can't go very far because I'm hooked back up again. And whom the sun sets free. <laughs> whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Can I tell you, he can put the clamp back on your leg, but it doesn't go because I've got a new mind. My mind has been renewed in this. I've got a mind of Christ. and I'm not hooked up to that thing anymore. So we begin to look at this. The false teachers in our time. My God. Some of us are old enough to remember Jim Jones in Guyana. David Koresh in Waco, Texas. And so many, many more. We're talking about man-made fire. They were following a man. They were following the charisma of a man. And what good did it do? It did them no good. In our church world today, how good is it doing to follow man-made rules? Churches in America right now are on a huge decline. I was talking to Pastor Jordan the other day, and he said, you like statistics. I love statistics. Tell me, that, that, to me, that almost gives me like, like, like a pulse of the church and what it's doing and how it's doing. And, and I don't care if it's in Illinois or if it's in, in, in Alabama or Tennessee or, or we got a pastor from Georgia here. In Georgia. I don't care where it's at. We're all going through the same thing right now. We're all trying to reach people, but all of a sudden, the genuine truth of the gospel seemingly doesn't work anymore, so we try to add. But yet, he said, don't add or take away. And yet, it seems like we're adding and trying to... Can I tell you, if you want to draw a crowd, just get Bozo the Clown. He can draw a clown. We don't need the crowd. We need God. God would draw the crowd. So we got, we got to come to a place. Let, 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 let me real quickly just shift gears here. Let me go to a God sent fire because that's what we need. We need a God sent fire. Can I tell you when God begins to move, the enemy will rise up and he will begin to try to stop what God is doing. Now, now, now make no bones about it. See, see we, want the, we want to go the path of least resistance. But that's not the way God takes us. Most of the time, he will take us through the path of most resistance. But we want to go through the least resistance. So I, I, I want to read to you here in, in Acts chapter 5. It said this, and now, this, here's the disciples. They're preaching the gospel, okay? They're preaching the gospel. They're seeing great things happening. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 38, this is after the outpouring. This is after the, 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 the lame man had got up from the gate. Now it says, and now I say to you, keep away from these men. And let them alone. For if this plan or this work of men, it will come to naught. This is Gamiel. He was a teacher in Israel. One of the most respected teachers. And this is what he's telling the men who are getting ready to try to persecute and to arrest the disciples who are preaching. He said, listen, if this is man-made, it's going to come to nothing. But if it's God... Verse 39, but if it's God, you cannot overthrow it. My God, help me right now. If it's God, you can't overthrow it. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. But if it's God, you can't stop it. Can I tell you, it's a ball that's rolling that you can't stop. You can't overthrow it. 
lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, if you keep on reading, they went out and they continued (laughs) to preach in the name of Jesus See, when the fire falls, can I tell you, not everybody's going to run up and pat you on the back and think that you're all that. When the fire falls, you're going to have some resistance. When your life radically changes and you really become a radical Christian, a Christ follower that's following him not just on Sunday morning, not just on Wednesday night, but you're following him every day of your life, something will change in your life because the people will come against you. There'll be a pruning. I never did understand pruning. I didn't like it and still don't like it. But I think it's a necessary thing that has to happen because there's some things that just need to drop off. Gayla's, Gayla's mother, she, she, she could make a rose bush I mean, it would be a blue ribbon at the fair, man. I, but, but in the wintertime, she'd cut that thing back, and I'd look at it, and I'd think, she's killed it. She just absolutely killed that rose bush. But boy, the next spring, that thing would come to life. And, but it just needed, it just needed some shaking. It just needed some things took off. It just needed some things chopped off and cut off so it could grow. Can I tell you, sometimes in our life there are just some things that need to be cut off that we can grow. There there just needs to be some things that we lay aside so we can grow and become the, the men and women that God has called us to be. So there's a fire that God sends and it cannot be stopped. It cannot be overthrown by the world. Listen, you are on the winning side if you're on Christ's side. You are on the winning side. Let me just give you a few examples. Moses and the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, the Bible said this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Verse 3, then Moses said, I'll not turn aside. I'll now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush burns and doesn't, does not be consumed. Why? Because God spoke to him. Moses is 80. He's tending to his father-in-law's sheep. And the Bible said he takes them on the back side of the desert sometimes He has to get us on the back side of the desert to get us away from the people. (laughs) He has to get us on the back side where there ain't nobody there telling us how we ought to be doing it, how we should be doing it, and what their opinion of it should be. He has to get us on the back side of the desert where there ain't anybody there. It's just a dry, barren thing, and you take your sheep there. And while he took his sheep there, all of a sudden, now, now can I tell you, that would have to be peculiar. Now, from what I have read, the burning bush was not peculiar. That happens in the desert. Bushes will ignite, but they are consumed. This one was different. The fire was there, but it wasn't being consumed. Moses wasn't amazed at the fire, but he was amazed it's not being consumed. All of a sudden, he got saying, wait a minute. Every one of them that I had ever seen before, they were all consumed, but this was not being consumed. So he started going over there toward it to see what was going on. And when he got over there, he heard a voice. Can I tell you, we need to hear a voice again. We need to hear a voice of God again. And the voice of God said, Moses, don't come any closer. The ground that you're standing on, it's holy ground. Take your shoes off. And all of a sudden, that fire, that God sent fire, took an 80 year old stuttering shepherd who didn't have good speech, took him 
and caused him to be a deliverer of the children of Israel who were locked up in bondage in Egypt. Can I tell you, a fire will make a difference in our life. It will change us from just being an ordinary shepherd to being a deliverer. Can I tell you, we need, we need to understand we're on holy ground. You say, well, preacher, I, 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 don't, I don't think we're on holy ground. Well, can I tell you in the nicest way I know how to tell you? I'm sorry you don't recognize. But where the Lord is. What made that holy? Not the bush burning. That didn't make it holy. What made it holy was the Lord was there. Can I tell you, if the Lord be here today and he said, if two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Can I tell you, this land here is a holy land because he's here. So we begin to look and we begin to understand that God can speak to us through the fire to cause us to be the people that we're supposed to be. Let me, let, let, let me, let me just get on through this. E- Elijah and the prophets of Baal, you, you know the story. Th- then, then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. I, I, I love that. If you, if you look at that in your Bible, it said you call on the name of your God, that's a little g. Can I tell you my God's a capital G? <laughs> And the Bible said, you call on your gods, which is little g, and I'll call on the Lord, which is a capital L, and the God, capital G, who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people said this. Here here was the deal. They were debating the prophets of Baal and Elijah. And, And Elijah said this. He said, you do your thing, and you call on your gods. I'm going to do my thing when you get done, and I'm going to call on my God. And let the God, capital G, let the real God, capital G, let him answer by fire. Now, now this is a story. I love this story. I I, I love this story. Because if you read the story, the way it's written, here's what you find out. These prophets of Baal, I, I got to give them, I got to give them credit. They had some perseverance. Because it said they started at the time of the morning sacrifice. They started early morning. And at midday. <laughs> See, we gripe if church goes past noon. At midday. They started early morning. At midday. The, the, I, I love Elijah. I, I love that guy. Man, we need some more Elijahs. While they're over there doing their thing, Elijah's over here making fun of them. He's over here saying, you, you may need to holler louder. He may be asleep. I, I, I love this guy. At the time of the evening sacrifice, they went all day long. Bible said they, listen, this almost would remind you of some Pentecostal revivals. They were around a fire, not in it, around it. They were jumping, they were shouting, they were cutting themselves to appease their God, said blood was gushing, but their God, little G, couldn't do nothing. Can I tell you, little G can't do nothing when big G's around. Aren't you glad your God's big G? Aren't you glad he's a big G, a capital G? All of a sudden, when they finally got done, they're wore out. Do you know what? I, listen, I traveled 18 years as an evangelist. I, I get it. I understand it. I, I understand why revivals are not a very prominent thing today. Be, because in the last 20, 30 years, here's what revivals were. Most of them were this. We hooped, we hollered, we shouted, we danced, and all we got was tired. Man, we couldn't wait for them to get over with because we were wore out. You know, we'd start early, we'd go late, and, what we, you know, the music would be going fast, and we'd be jumping, we'd be hollering. I mean, we'd look like little Jackson up here. Man, we'd be just, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. We'd go home, we're wore out. We're out. It's your name. That's who I'm talking about. <laughs> we, we just wore out. We were tired. And so we don't, we, don't, we don't do revivals much anymore now because we're just tired. We're wore out. We just, but can I tell you the few Please hear me. The few, what I would call real revivals, 
We never got tired. I was at Myth Cassidy's church. Gayla and I was in, started in 96 and didn't end until the uh, first part of 97. Five months. And can I tell you, there was no tiredness in that. It wasn't, it wasn't just a scheduled meeting. It was a move of God. People were being saved. People were being healed. People were being delivered. It wasn't just a, a series of meetings. It was a move of God. What you and I have got to understand is there's a difference between man-made and God-sent. And when, when Elijah finally said, listen, guys, it's, it's my turn. Here, here's what he did. He rebuilt, he repaired the altar. Can I tell you, there, there's some things that we need to repair. There's some things that we need to rebuild. And he rebuilt the altar. Now watch this. you you got to remember... They've been in a three and a half year drought. Three and a half years, no dew, let alone no rain. Drought. And after three and a half years, Elijah, this great man of God, he, he, he saw all this commotion for eight to ten hours. Man, they're exhausted, they're sweating, they're tired, they're laying down. And, and this man of God, he rebuilds this altar. And I ain't got time to get into it today, but he rebuilds it with 12 stones. Twelve tribes of Israel. The prophets of Baal used to be prophets of God. But when Jezebel got there, they turned. So when he began to build, rebuild the altar, 12 stones, they began to think 12. There, there was 12 tribes. Can I tell you, he was preaching without saying anything. He rebuilt that altar and he took his sacrifice and he laid on the altar. And he says, guys, I need water. Three and a half year drought. Twelve barrels of water. He takes and he pours over his sacrifice. Now, now you've you got to remember what he just said. Let the real God answer by fire. Fire and water don't mix. <laughs> he just drowned it. His sacrifice. Then he didn't even do anything Pentecostal. That's the part that I can't get over. If he would have just been a little Pentecostal. He gets there. He lays that altar, that sacrifice on it. He drowns it with the water. And he just prays a simple prayer. About 63 words. When he closed his prayer, fire came down from heaven. It Bible said it consumed the sacrifice. It licked up the water. And they said, the prophets of Baal said, your God is the real God. Can I tell you the world needs to know that our God is the real God. He's the capital G God. See, all the things they were doing, they weren't getting anything. And sometimes when we do the mechanics in it, we're not getting what God wants us to get. When you and I would just will allow God. Can I tell you, it doesn't take loud preaching. It doesn't take fast songs. A preacher can sit on a stool and preach the word and the fire can fall. We can sing a slow song as slow as slow can be sung and the fire can fall. We can sing a fast one that everybody's clapping and dancing and jumping, and the fire can fall. It doesn't matter. What matters is are we setting an atmosphere? See, our job is not to let the fire fall. Our job is to set the atmosphere that the fire does fall. So if we create an atmosphere that God is comfortable in, the fire will fall. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just wrap this up with one more illustration here. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and it set upon each of them. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just condense this down real quick. When Peter was following Jesus in town after they had arrested him, Jesus was taken inside to be interrogated 
And Peter was standing outside. Now, I, I, you, you, I, I know you know this, but I want you just to let God make this magnify in your spirit. Peter is standing by a fire. He can feel the effects of the fire, but he's not in the fire. Isn't it sad that a lot of folks are satisfied with just feeling the effects of church? If you sing loud enough or fast enough, if the preacher preaches loud enough, then, then I can feel the effect and I can get a goosebump experience and I feel like that it's, aha, we can go home now. Can I tell you, I don't care if I never have another goosebump experience. I just want the presence of God. But Peter's standing by a fire. And I, I really believe that a lot of our churches today, this is where they're at. I mean, this is a, this is a, a type and shadow. Of the We're standing by a fire. We feel the effects of the fire. And when the little handmaiden come up and said, hey, I know you. You're, you're, I saw you with Jesus. You're, you're a fire. And he goes, no, no, no not me. In fact, one of the writers said that, it, that Peter began to curse, to act like the world. And, but they still thought he was a follower. They still something about him that... Now, let's, let's fast forward. Probably about 52 days. Fast forward. 53 days. We'll fast forward this thing. Peter. He's in that upper room. Tongues of fire. One set on him. He's not standing by it. It's in him. Can I tell you there's a difference from standing by it than it's setting in you. And when it's set on him, this man who couldn't tell some handmaidens that he knew Jesus, now he steps out to the crowd that literally killed Jesus and he begins to declare the gospel of Christ. He begins to talk to them and without any fear, he begins to speak boldly to them and the Bible said about 3,000 people that day accepted Christ. We need the fire. Play softly for me. We, we need the fire of God because listen, without the fire... You, you can walk behind the building here in our fire pit where we have sometimes we'll burn and have weenie roasts and stuff. You can go back there now. There's nothing attractive about it. It's old, black, burnt wood. Grass is growing up in it. It's ugly. But let Gala and Kevin build a fire in it. I mean, they, they are like fire bugs, man. I, I mean, they, they won't have a little fire. I mean, this thing, you'll, you'll be 20 feet from it, and your, your skin will be wrinkling from the heat of it. It just, I mean, Kevin and Gail are like, well, let's get some more gas and throw on that thing. You know, let's just. <laughs> but when that fire's burning, that wood in there, it's not all black and ugly and burnt out and. Now it's bright. It's burning. There's no grass in it. It's all burnt out. And the grass is gone and the fire is bright. And There's a difference. I wonder how many of us are just standing by a fire spiritually. We've never really jumped in the fire. We just stand by it. and We're content. I mean, we're good people. You know, we're not doing anything bad. We're not going out and killing people. We're not, you know, getting drunk and we're not, you know, smoking and doping and doing, all. We know we're just good folks. But how many of us are just, see, I really believe, Miss Rhonda, I, I, I just, this is my belief. I believe the fire can burn tumors out and shrink tumors and I, I believe when the fire of God falls and the people of God begin to pray, I, I, I believe we start seeing the effects of it. And I, I believe sometimes God will do it the way he's doing it with you. So the doctors will go, wait a minute. They, they're not supposed to be going backwards. They're supposed to be going. F but when the fire falls, can I tell you, when the fire falls, habits that normally you can't get rid of, they'll go away. 
they'll not be a problem anymore. But when we try to do it ourselves, we just need a God sent fire. Can I tell you it will bring joy into your life? I'm talking about the fire of God. I'm not, I'm not talking about just a hype. I'm talking about the fire of God. It will bring a difference in our life. If you got sin in your life, can I tell you, the fire of God will burn the sin out. What you and I need is a fire. We just need the fire of God. And until the fire falls, we'll continue to fight and battle and struggle and but when the fire falls, we can be like them that come out of that upper room. We can begin to speak boldly. We can look at someone who is lame and say, in the name of Jesus, I don't have the money that you think you want, but what, I, what you really need, I do have. And in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And all of a sudden, they'll just jump to their feet and they'll begin to walk and they'll go to the house of God praising. See, I really believe this. I really believe that abundant life right now, we're in a place that we need the fire to fall. I think we're on that launching pad and we're ready to go, but we need the fire to fall. Brother Eric, you and Miss Rhonda, would you come up? Pastor Jordan, Pastor Paul, you and Linda, would you come up? We're going to pray. And I, I, it's, it's eight minutes to 12. And if you got, if you got an appointment for lunch, see ya. I got an appointment with God. So you can do what you need to do, but I, I'm going to stay here with God for a little while. So if you need something from God, can I tell you, if it's healing, if it's forgiveness, uh, whatever you need, when the fire falls, it will make a difference in your life. So that's why I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, if you have a need, I'm, you don't have to tell them what it is. If it's personal, you don't have to tell them. Just tell them to pray for me. I need the fire. I, this is what I want you to do. While I'm praying, I want you to get up. And I want you to walk down and stand in front of one of these. And I want us to pray. And I want God to have his way in doing what only God can do. So while I'm praying, if you want prayer, I want you to get up and come. For whatever, forgiveness of sin, you got it. You, you can be born again this morning. You can leave here healed this morning. You can leave here set free this morning. Not just talking free. I'm talking about free. You can leave here changed. So if you need it, let's go. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we pray today. God, we're praying for the fire of God to fall upon your people today. God, we know that when the fire falls, lives are changed, God. We know that bodies are healed. God, we know that the sick are healed. God, that the, the, those that are in bondage are set free. And we understand that, God. And, Father, we just cry out today and we say, God, would you come? And, God, would you pour out your spirit? God, would you let the fire of God fall on your people today? God, how we need you. We need you, God. We need your presence. We need your power, God. We need you to do what we can't do, God. We need you. God, we're praying your will would be done. Would you stretch your hand this way? And would you pray for those who have come down this morning that God would do what only he can do in our lives.